Our scripture lesson today is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When you look at the news these days, one of the things that is talked about is how the shelves are getting to be fairly barren. And you better get your Christmas shopping done quick because there's no guarantee that there's going to be what you want to get when it's time to come for those of us who wait till the last minute to look at shopping. All the tech gizmos, the new phones and things like that are going quick. All the latest toys and even the clothes they're predicting might be kind of missing when you go shopping. Now they're attributing all of this to the disruption in the supply chain caused by the pandemic. And that is a significant factor in it. It's almost kind of reminiscent of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. When the weather said, we might call Santa and say, we're going to have to cancel Christmas because we can't get stuff to the kids. Well, the pandemic is making people have the same sense of foreboding. And there's no, no creature with a bright red nose to get us out of it. But part of it is all from the impact of advertising. For those of you in marketing, I'm not trying to beat you up. Mimi spent some time in marketing herself, and uh, she taught me some of the tricks. But advertising is designed to make you feel like you need something that you really don't. You know, you deserve this neat new toy. You need to have this little gizmo. And the one that kind of gets me is one I heard a while back when I was still in systems consulting for the bank. We were developing a whole new check processing system for the bank and a guy from marketing came to me and said, we need to add this new feature because this is sexy. And I looked at him and said, how in the world is check processing sexy? And he just looked at me like, don't you know? <laughs> no. That's not the first thing I think about when I think of sex. It's check processing, running a bunch of checks through a sorter and getting them ready for sending out. But that's the type of thing that we see in advertising. All these ads are implying that this next little thing is going to make you happy. You see these advertisements about all these youthful people dancing around with the latest telephone or how much this nice couple needs this brand new car or you need that new outfit with the you know jeans shoes dress jacket whatever on and on and on and the kids have certainly got to have that brand new toy that just came out that's going to disappear and of course you got to get yourself that new 72 inch TV because the 50 inch one you got just ain't big enough. See, advertising purposely uses psychological principles developed by Sigmund Freud to get you to convince yourself that what you want is actually a need. And they, the idea is that they send the message often enough that eventually you get it into your psyche, that your desires, your wants, are actually your needs. 
It's the same type of thing that Joseph Goebbels used to convince the German people prior to World War II that what Hitler was offering was what the country needed. Advertising takes our desires and convinces us that those things are our needs and we can't do without them. It has led to something that uh, has been described as affluenza. That term was first used in 1973, which is the year I graduated high school, so it's been a while. And the term affluenza basically, according to Merriam-Webster, means the unhealthy and unwelcome psychological and social effects of affluence regarded especially as a widespread societal problem, such as feelings of guilt, lack of motivation, and social isolation experienced by wealthy people. The note says, even so, psychologists are slowly recognizing that great riches are sometimes accompanied by a wealth of crippling emotional and psychological fears. Affluenza can be acute, striking lottery winners, our newly minted doctors, and MBAs. It can also be a chronic and pervasive condition in families where riches extend through generations. A sub-definition says, affluenza is extreme materialism and consumerism associated with the pursuit of wealth and success and resulting in a life of chronic dissatisfaction, debt, overwork, stress, and impaired relationships. Basically, it leads to a dissatisfaction with life was because what you have is never going to be enough. So how do you know if you have any of the effects of affluenza in your life? Well, are your credit cards maxed out from purchasing stuff? Do you need a storage unit for your stuff? Now keep in mind, storage unit rental is one of the fastest growing businesses in the country breaking in several billion dollars a year. Do you feel guilty about having stuff you don't use? And i got to confess, that's me. I've got seven guitars, two mandolins, a bass, and a tenor sax, and I almost never get a chance to play any of them. And I don't like that. Do you have a savings account but not much in it, and it isn't growing. Do you, buy, do you enjoy buying stuff just for fun? Are you spending more and more, but enjoying life less? Now, it is possible to recover from influenza, but it takes some real deep soul searching. First, you have to, like anything, admit the possibility that you have it. And you have to review your priorities for life. What is your attitude towards money? Do you never have enough? Or do you always need more? Is money your tool or your master? That Jesus says in 624. You can get over by trusting God to supply your needs. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, had a lot to say about money. He's best remembered for his quote, having first gained all you can, and secondly, save all you can, then give all you can. Now this was something that he made not just sermons about, but he actually lived it. A little bit of history on John Wesley. His father was an Anglican priest in a poor parish in England. He grew up dirt poor. They struggled week to week, day to day, just to have enough for food and clothing and shelter. When John Wesley felt the call to go into his father's business, his first attitude was, well, I feel called by God to preach, but not necessarily to take on my father's poverty. And so for a while he did. He took a position at Oxford University and became a fellow there. 
and was paid rather well for the time. And he enjoyed life. He took up tobacco and playing cards and brandy. And pretty much spent his money the way he wanted to. But something happened there that changed his whole attitude about it. He had just bought and finished paying for some pictures for his room. And one of the chambermaids came to his door to clean up. It was a cold winter day, and he noticed that she had nothing to protect her except a thin linen gown. He reached into his pockets to give her some money to buy a coat, but found he had too little left. Immediately the thought struck him that the Lord was not pleased with the way he had spent his money. He asked himself, Will thy master say, Well done, good and faithful servant? Thou hast adorned thy walls with the money which might have screened this poor creature from the cold. O oh, justice, O oh, mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? From that point on, he decided that he was not going to live that way anymore. Now, at the time, in 1731, he was making a, a yearly income of 30 pounds, which would have been a really good salary at the time. And for a single man to live on, it was more than enough. But he kept track of his expenses and his income, and he found that through the year, he only needed 28 pounds on which to live. He gave the other two pounds away. The next year, he doubled his income to 60 pounds, but still managed to live on only 28. So he gave away 32 pounds. The following year, he made 90 pounds, still lived on 28. The year after that, 120. But throughout his life, he kept his expenses at 28 to 30 pounds. One year he actually made 1,400 pounds, which would have been a good five-figure salary today. He lived on 30 pounds and gave the rest away. His attitude was that Christians should not merely tithe, but give away all extra income once the family and creditors were taken care of. He believed that with increasing income, what should rise is not the Christian standard of living, with the standard of giving. He continued that throughout his life. He was even accused by the tax collectors of not reporting things properly because there was a tax on the silver. And the tax commissioner came, inspected his tax return, and wrote him the following, We cannot doubt but you have plate, silver plate, for which you have hitherto neglected to make an entry. They were saying, a man of his prominence certainly must have more silver plate in his home. And they were accusing him to fail to pay an excise tax on him. Wesley wrote back, I have two silver spoons in London and two in Bristol. This is all the plate I have at present, and I shall not buy any more while so many around me want bread. Now you've heard what his basic rule was. Gain all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. He pointed out that when people spend money on things they do not really need, they begin to want more things they do not need. Instead of satisfying their desires, they only increase them. Now, he knew it wasn't easy to do that, and he knew that there had to be a scriptural basis for it. And so he set up four scriptural principles. Provide things needful for yourself and your family, which he gleaned from 1 Timothy 5.8. The believer should make sure the family has a sufficiency of plain, wholesome food to eat and clean raiment to put on, as well as a place to live and enough to live on if something were to happen to the breadwinner. The second principle is having food and raiment. Let us be there with content. 
That's from 1 Timothy 6 8. Whoever has sufficient food to eat and raiment to put on with a place to lay his head and something over is rich, he said. Third, provide things honest in the sight of all men, Romans 12, 17, and owe no man anything, Romans 13, 8. Wesley said the next claim on a Christian's money is his creditors. Now, that is essentially true today. Because if you look at credit card debt and debt in this country, well, that is basically the current day version of slavery. How many of us are working to pay off debt? And doing things we don't necessarily want to, working harder than we want to, because we have to. Because we are enslaved to how much money we owe. We are enslaved to our creditors. And we cannot break out of that. Fourth, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Galatians 6.10 after the Christian has provided for the family, the creditors of the business, the next obligation to use any money that is left to meet the needs of others. Now he knew that this would not be an easy lifestyle to do. He knew that there would be things that would need to be looked at. And so he came up with four questions that Christians should ask themselves. First, in spending this money, am I acting like I own it? Or am I acting like the Lord's steward, trustee? Second, what scripture requires me to spend this money this way? Third, can I offer up this purchase as a sacrifice to the Lord? And fourth, will God reward me for this expenditure at the resurrection of the just? Wesley didn't just preach these things. As I said, he lived them. When he died in 1791, the only money mentioned in his will were a few coins that were found in his pockets and dresser drawers. He had earned over 30,000 pounds through his lifetime, which would be the equivalent of well over a million dollars today. He gave almost all of it away. He said once, when I die, if I leave behind me 10 pounds, you and all mankind can bear witness against me that I have lived and died a thief and a robber. John Wesley set an example of what it meant to live with an abundance and how to use the abundance that he had it kind of comes down to what Jesus says in Matthew 6 as he continues. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Are we really trusting in God to meet our needs? In our scripture passage, in the middle of it, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That seems like an odd thing to throw in between two 
statements regarding money. But actually, it has to do not with what you're looking at, your eyes. It has to do with what are the thoughts behind what you're looking at. Are you looking at things with a lust or desire for them? Are you looking at things with God's thoughts behind you? Is this something that you actually need? Or is this something that you don't really need? You just want it. Because if you're looking at things with the eyes of desire, saying, I really want this thing. more likely you're serving money than God. We should each be asking ourselves, what master do we serve? Are we living our lives serving God? Or are we living our lives serving money? Do we have enough? Do we have Food, clothing, shelter. Do we really need a new phone? Do we really need a new car? Do we really need all these little things that advertising tells us that we really have to have to make life happen? It reminds me of John D. Rockefeller. Someone once asked him, do you have enough? How much is enough for you? The response was, a little bit more. If we're looking at the things of this world to find happiness, we will never be satisfied. No matter what we purchase, no matter what we have, no matter what we get, any happiness or satisfaction will be short-lived and then we'll become dissatisfied again. And that cycle will continue because we've gotten into the mindset of thinking we have to have stuff to make us happy. We need to remember that all the stuff in the world is God's. Not ours. It's not ours to purchase. It's not ours to own. We don't own anything. God does. We are his trustees. We are his stewards of what he has given us. Are we using it according to his will? How is his kingdom being advanced by what we do with our money? Is the light of our eyes from God? Or is the light in our eyes a darkness that only sees the things of this world and desires them? What master do we serve? Do we serve God? Or do we serve money?